Hello and welcome to Guns and Gear. You know, uh, I think I have maybe a, a little over 150 videos now, and I'm not sure that many of my videos have uh, importance. You know, sometimes I talk about some, some fairly important things, but, you know, nothing to the degree I think that this video may approach. Uh, I recently had a phone conversation just a few days back with Colonel Richard Hunter. Uh, mad, bad voodoo. And what a great guy he is, and I tell you, man, he is just a master storyteller. And we, uh, we actually talked on the phone quite a, quite a long time, and it was very enjoyable. And at some point in time during the conversation, we got talking about you know, how we first got started on, on YouTube and the reasons why. And uh, I expressed to him about my heart attack and, you know, and my grandson. And, uh, you know, I sort of told him bits and pieces of my story, of my experience, because I knew he had had a, a heart attack also. And he goes, man, you have just, you've just got to make a video about this. You know? And so I thought that would be a pretty good idea. And I, I, I just noticed that he has reposted his video uh, talking about his experience. So I thought I would go ahead and turn on the camera and, and give this a try. Uh, not really sure where to start uh, uh, with this, with my story. So I'm going to start in January of 2009. Okay. In January of 2009, I was uh, diagnosed with diabetes. And uh, how I got diagnosed was uh, because I have a CDL because of my job and that requires a DOT physical every couple of years and I was getting my DOT physical and part of that physical they make you pee in a cup and they test the urine in a couple different ways and one of those things is they put a little strip in there and they uh, they were saying that I had uh, sugar in my urine so the doctor uh, just used a regular little meter, well it's probably a lot more advanced than, than what uh, you can get from the drugstore, but he checked my blood and my blood, uh, my sugar level was very high and according to him it was extremely high and he was very uh, concerned. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was 750 something, but at any rate he was explaining to me that you know, my number should be uh, under 100 or around that hundred mark, you know. <laughs> so I was quite a ways away from that. So I did, I may, he, he, you know, he encouraged me, he almost demanded that uh, I go see a doctor immediately, and I did. I, I don't have a, a family doctor anymore, or a primary care physician, I think they call him now. <clears throat> he had retired several years ago, and I really wasn't that good at going to him anyway. I, I haven't had very many physicals in my life. Uh, I don't know that I've had any that I said, hey, you know what, I need to go get a physical. Usually they involve sports or my job. So I went to the doctor and, and they ran a whole bunch of tests on me and yes, I have type 2 diabetes and you know began to give me some different kinds of, of medicine at different levels to try to get these numbers where they should be. Now in February of 2009 uh, I don't remember what I was doing. I would think I was doing something in the yard and I began to feel uh, a pain in my chest and that pain was uh, located on the left side and it was kind of a sharp pain right around the heart region you know and I really didn't know what to think about it. I sat down for a minute, you know, and uh, it kind of subsided a little bit and I went back to doing whatever I was doing, you know. It went away. Couldn't have been bad, it went away. But from that point on, uh, there was several times where I would get to be doing something there and I would get this, uh, this pain across my left side of my chest and it was kind of a sharp pain, it was a piercing pain. And uh, you know, I took an aspirin and it went away. Uh, uh, very quickly, actually. And so I thought to myself, Lord in mercy, I'm, uh, I'm having some issues with my heart, I'm going to need to go you know, see a doctor, I guess. 
But we were at work, kind of involved with something very serious at the time, and uh, I was going to go ahead and get past that, and I would make some time and, and go see a doctor. Well, for several months, uh, and with more frequency, uh, I started having these pains in my chest. And I would take an aspirin, and uh, uh, they would go away. You know, My wife had had some pretty serious surgery, and as a result of that surgery, after uh, a couple of weeks, she needed to start walking around and stuff. And I would walk with her, and it even got to the point where if I was just walking with her, um, I would start to get them, them pains and there was once or twice that it, the pain got so bad I told her that I was having a cramp in my foot and I needed to go on home uh, which was not exactly the truth but I needed to get to that aspirin bottle and take an aspirin so that that pain would go away now fast forward to June of uh, 2009 that's right from February to June, I had been, you know, taking aspirins uh, every time I had pain in my, my chest. And when uh, later, when my cardiologist asked me, you know, well, how many do you think this is? I don't, I don't know. It's probably close to 100 times. I don't know. It was a lot. I know that. It was a lot. I don't know that I can give an accurate number. But beginning of June of uh, 09. I was starting, getting ready to start my day and had a lot of things that I needed to get done. And I started, I got uh, just a horrible pain in my chest. And it, you know, I, to describe it, it was a very sharp, intense pain. It ran right across my left part of my chest and up into my armpit. And that was the uh, uh, description that, that uh, I can best tell you uh, that was going on. I didn't have, uh, you know, some people say that they have a uh, pain in their, their lower jaw and I didn't have any of that. It was a stabbing, piercing, intense pain across my chest into my armpit. So I took an aspirin and uh, it did not subside. And the pain was getting worse. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, the pain was to the point where it was all uh, encompassing. It was the only thing on my mind. I took another aspirin and uh, it had no effect and as a matter of fact it was now getting uh, difficult for me to uh, do anything and I knew that uh, well I've waited too long you know so I dialed 911 and this was the case that I had mentioned in a, a video uh, talking about calling 911 it was busy and uh, I waited a, a minute or so and I called again and it was busy. And uh, I waited maybe 30 seconds and I called again and I finally got through. And at this point, um, I was, uh, for the first time, I was, I was scared of what was happening. I knew I was having a heart attack. And uh, it actually felt like my uh, heart was about to bust out of my chest, which I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. In a minute. So, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of things on TV where the uh, 911 dispatcher uh, stays with the uh, on the line with the individual. Uh, she had uh, told me that you know EMTs are on the way, and our firehouse isn't very far away, and so uh, they were here quickly. I mean, you know five, six, eight minutes at the most, they were in front of my house. <clears throat> but she had let me, she had uh, let me go saying that they were, they were on the way. And I was sitting here, actually, right here in this couch, right here where I'm sitting now. And the pain was, was uh, debilitating at that point. And I began to wonder, how are they going to get in my house? Now, many of you that watch uh, uh, some of my videos, you know that I have Sarge, you know, a very large English Mastiff. And uh, at that time, I also had Gabriel, which was an even larger uh, English Mastiff. And both of those dogs were absolutely, uh, are absolutely, Gabriel's no longer with us, but 
uh, they are top notch at guard duty. No one is coming into this house unless me or my wife allows them into this house. And th that includes friends. I've had friends come over and my wife could not convince Gabriel and or Sarge to let them in the house until I got home. So uh, this was going to present a problem and I feared that I was going to die right here on the couch while the EMTs were trying to figure out how to get to me. <laughs> so I, I figured that you know my best bet was to get outside uh, and uh, that's when I really knew how bad this was really getting because I really I couldn't walk across the room and get to the door to open the door. Uh, when I got up from the chair, uh, you know, it was it was horrible, and I only was able to make a step or two. And the rest of the way, I basically had to crawl to get to the door and open the door and get myself through there. And, it, and I was extremely focused, and I never thought anything could prevent me any pain or anything could prevent me from doing something so simple but I finally made it through I, I got outside and I was sitting on the steps and I, I wasn't there but maybe two minutes uh, when the EMT showed up and I tried to stand up because uh, I'm not exactly the smallest of guys um, kind of a big fellow and uh, I didn't want him to drop me or anything trying to get me into the gurney but there was a fire truck behind them so they had plenty of folks to help and uh, I started to stand up and the guy was like oh please don't move and they ran up to me and uh, got me and put me on the gurney and you know I was getting ready to have my very first ambulance ride sirens and lights going going through stoplights the whole nine yards and uh, they were doing an assessment on me and they were uh, reporting that to the hospital it was all real time they uh, gave me four baby aspirin and uh, they had already hooked things up to my chest and were monitoring that and got me to the emergency room and at the emergency room of course they uh, <clears throat> put on different uh, little patch things and hooked me up to their monitors and uh, I was having two things going on actually my heart attack uh, the pain of my heart attack was subsiding but my heart still felt like I mean my heart felt like it was just going like this okay and it I, I literally thought if I looked down at my chest I would see my chest going like this it was just pronounced and you know I was having an issue with my my heart rhythm also and this nurse came in there and the doctor had had, had walked out I guess he wanted to get uh, some particular equipment or anything, uh, something for me. They actually brought in what they call that crash cart and stuff, you know. And uh, she looked at me and uh, she said, how about grabbing the rails and just strain with all your might like you're trying to poop, okay? And uh, I did, I gave that a try and voila, almost immediately, my heart stopped jumping around. And she explained that she had worked with a, in a cardiologist with a cardiologist for many years, and uh, and she had a name for this technique, and, and uh, I don't remember what it was. I want to say it started with a V, but eh, I can't think of what it was. But at any rate, uh, they uh, monitored me for a little while. I seemed to have been past the worst of it, and finally a doctor came in there and said that they were going to release me but that I needed, and he emphasized that I really needed to go see a doctor, uh, a cardiologist. And that same nurse had come back in there and she had uh, uh, given me a, a, a couple of names of some of the top cardiologists in the area. So, uh, that very next day I, I had made an appointment. I was, not, I was unable to get the uh, cardiologist uh, that she had named as the top one but I was uh, I got an appointment with one of his associates uh, it, it turns out it's a, it's a group of cardiologists there and the uh, the doctor was uh, 
Uh, he, he, he wasn't very particularly happy with my story that they let me go so soon. <clears throat> and he uh, wanted to immediately give me some tests, and he did run some tests, but there was other tests, like a stress test and other, another test similar that uh, he wanted me to have immediately. And this was a Friday, and uh, so he, you know, Monday morning I was going to have these tests. And he had wrote me a prescription for the uh, nitro pills that uh, maybe in my EDC videos y'all have seen me show that little thing that I have on my key ring that contains my, my little bottle of uh, nitroglycerin pills that I carry with me all the time now. And, uh, you know, just uh, impressed on me how important it was that I get these tests done, that, you know, we really need to get a good idea of what's going on. So, I come home that evening, and uh, the next day, you know, pretty much okay. I, I, I felt tired more than anything. Uh, I, loss of energy, you know, I, I just felt like a, a Mack truck had hit me. I was just tired. And uh, Sunday comes along. And that morning, I started getting the pain in my chest. And as per my normal regimen, I reached for a bottle of bare aspirin and took an aspirin. And it didn't have any effect. And the pain was again uh, intensifying. It intensified quickly. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting there looking on the table there and. and looking at a daggone prescription for those uh, nitroglycerin pills and kicking myself for not getting the prescription filled. So I called for my wife and I said, honey, I need you to go get these, this prescription filled for me. And she goes, yes, I was going to do some running around and I need to stop at the uh, drugstore. Uh, I'll get that done. I said, no, I need you to get them now, right now, right now. And that really scared her. And she says, do you want to call an ambulance? I said, not yet. I think, let's see what the pills will do. So, I don't know what that conversation must have been like at the pharmacy. But uh, my wife was back home in no time. <laughs> I, uh, I can't say that uh, she was any less scared than I was. And so, you know, per the directions that the doctor had given me, I put one of those nitroglycerin pills under my lip, uh, under my tongue, and uh, uh, nothing happened. It was still intense pain. And, and once again, it was like a, a, a stabbing, piercing pain right across my chest into my underarm. Same as before. And, uh, I took another one and I said, honey, I think we're going to have to go to the emergency room. So I got up and, uh, and struggled, but I was able to get you know, to my wife's car and I had since took the third uh, nitroglycerin pill. And like, as I said before, our hospital isn't very far from where we live. I uh, made it to the hospital and I will say one thing, when you go to an emergency room, if you've ever had to sit in an emergency room, I've sat in an emergency room with huge gashes and injuries and things of that nature and have to wait hours uh, to uh, actually get called in the back and get some treatment. Uh, you come into a hospital and you got chest pains, you move straight to the line, <laughs> straight to the front of the line. <laughs> They immediately got me back there and they did a quick uh, triage and they, you know, they oh my God, he, you're, you're having a heart attack and you know, into the emergency room I go and this time they kept me. Um, and later that evening I, I had the heart flip flopping around but I wasn't having that at that point. I was having a uh, heart attack and I ended up staying overnight. Now that evening a uh, cardiologist came in to talk to me and it happened to be the cardiologist that that nurse had recommended he was on call for that hospital and they had called him in and we had a conversation and uh, he was asking me you know uh, about my experience and I gave him a Reader's Digest version of uh, you know from February to that evening and he was uh, 
taken back by that, but he was kind of holding a poker face, and he goes, well, we're going to run tests on you first thing in the morning. And they had already ran some tests on me that, that day and, and that evening. And that morning, he shows up, uh, and he said, uh, young man, you're going, to, you're going straight to uh, Norfolk General. Now, Norfolk General is a pretty renowned hospital, from my understanding, on the East Coast, and it has two things that it does really well. Their heart hospital is considered one of the best in the country, and uh, their burn center is considered either the best or the second best in the country you know, for the last 15, 20 years. So when he told me that uh, they were transferring me immediately to Norfolk General, that was another list on your checklist of, crap, this must be serious. Well, they, uh, they were moving me to Norfolk General to immediately uh, uh, have surgery. And what they had found is I had uh, four blockages, four uh, major blockages. And so I got four stents put in. Now, if you've ever, I don't know if there's different procedures for, for putting in stents, but for me, they went up an artery in my leg. And uh, they put the stents in. Everything in that procedure, I was awake, okay? I was awake. Matter of fact, I was asking questions. And they were responding. I had a nurse that actually brought around one of the stents and showed me. It's like a little Chinese finger thing, you know, a little, little mesh thing. And I showed one to me and everything. Now, when I was in the recovery room, that was the worst part of the whole procedure. Because <laughs> I guess they had to make a pretty good size incision uh, in that artery in your leg in order to uh, perform this procedure. And so, uh, you know, they had, there was a nurse, there was two nurses in my room and there was a, in my recovery room. And there was a nurse that was, you know, pressing on, and it was, it's up towards the crotch area of your leg and she was pressing on that you know and it was a bit uncomfortable you know and she had kept that pressure on for like uh, 15 minutes 20 minutes I'm not exactly sure how long it was but it was a good it was a good long period of time and it was becoming uncomfortable and she was you know her and the other nurse and as a matter of fact the nurse that was actually um, applying the, the direct pressure you know, it was kind of new, and the other nurse was, was kind of there to, uh, uh, you know, train her, I guess. Well, when she moved her hand, uh, that gauze that she had, when she moved that, I mean, you know, blood literally squirted straight up, and I could see it. Then the other nurse took over, and God bless her heart, uh, she was a bit heavier, and she put every ounce of weight that she had on that direct pressure, and uh, man, that was... That was killing me. <laughs> but she was able to uh, uh, stop the bleeding. They uh, put me in the heart hospital uh, section in the intensive care. And again, I had, at this point, I had, you know, big hunks of hair shaved off of my chest. <laughs> and I had all this stuff uh, attached to me. And I was there for a, a couple of days for observation. And I thought I was going to be getting out. Uh, and my doctor came in to speak with me and he was explaining to me that uh, you know because I've been hooked up to this to these uh, machines they had on the side there that uh, I have a uh, issue with my rhythm and he went into great detail to explain that uh, that issue and the fact that I would not be leaving the hospital that I had, that I was going to have another procedure, or I needed to have another procedure, and that I was extremely fortunate that one of the best cardiologists around uh, for doing that specific procedure actually had a uh, opening, <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, to for me to have that procedure done the very next day. And he said that, well, I'll have that, I'll have that uh, doctor come in and talk to you. So, uh, a few hours later, I've called my wife, I'm letting her know that it looks like they're gonna keep me in here for a little while, they wanna perform another procedure. 
and um, you know both doctors come in. Now this doctor may be the uh, top guy at what he does. Uh, zero bedside manner, zero. He uh, he talked very monotone, very as matter of factly, and um, he he basically was telling me that they're going to go up a vein, not an artery, into my heart. They're going to induce the uh, the the bad heart rhythm, and then they're going to kill that portion of my heart. <laughs> and I was laying there, and I just kind of looked at him, and I went, "You're going to do what?" He goes, "Yeah, we're going to identify the bad uh, rhythm." Uh, we're going to induce it, and then we're going to kill the portion of the heart that's causing that bad rhythm. And that just didn't sound good to me. <laughs> and I looked at my other doctor, who I lovingly refer to as my plumber now. I have an electrician and a plumber. And I looked at my plumber and I went, you are on dope if you think I'm going to let this guy start killing portions of my heart, you know. And, uh, uh, he, he chuckled a little bit. He kind of looked down and chuckled, and he, and he goes, Van, what this procedure is, uh, it's fibers. It's, it's almost hair-like fibers in your heart that uh, cause the, the bad rhythm. And what they are basically going to do is short-circuit those fibers, those tiny little fibers. And that sounded a whole lot better to me. <laughs> So I agreed to the surgery and filled out all, signed my name on the dotted line all those times that you have to sign it. And uh, uh, you know, they also explained that sometimes the uh, procedure can be rather lengthy because when they short circuit one little fiber, another little fiber will pop up and then another little fiber will pop up and so forth and so on. Uh, according, uh, and this is a, uh, a procedure uh, uh, that you are out. They, they, uh, they have an anesthesiologist and they knock you out and, and they perform this, this uh, procedure, ablation, I believe it's called. And uh, when I woke up in the recovery room and my wife came in there, you know, she was very distressed because uh, evidently this procedure had taken like six hours. It been a very long procedure and actually uh, my plumber was present even though he wasn't a part of the uh, procedure and had come out a couple of times and talked to my wife to let her know that this was still going on. So, uh, you know, my electrician comes in to my room and, you know, explains to me, you know, what all that they had done and he had felt that the uh, procedure had been successful. It was only like a day, two, I think it was a, no, I may have stayed in the hospital two more days. I had uh, stayed in the heart hospital in intensive care at Norfolk General uh, for seven days before they released me, which uh, <laughs> if you know anything about uh, hospitals these days, they want to get you in and get you out. <laughs> and actually they were rather concerned about letting me go at that particular point in time because they wanted to continue to monitor. But uh, that's basically my story and uh, my experience uh, that, I, that I've had. Uh, I will say that uh, if you get anything out of this uh, recollection at all, maybe it's uh, you need to get your yearly physical. You know? Maybe you need to go to a doctor more often. I mean, Quite honestly, if I didn't have a bone broke that I that I didn't think I could set, or it didn't have, or had a cut or something that I didn't think I could put the stitches in, and I didn't go to a doctor, and we need to take better care of ourselves. Uh, I mean, if for no other reason, for your family, you know, uh, I have a grandson that's four years old now, and uh, I can't wait. Uh, for him to get of age for us to start doing some camping and shooting and you know things of that nature with him and if you need to find some type of uh, inspiration uh, then find it but do the things that you need to do now the whole reason I started this story back in January 
is that uh, it, it's pretty much a proven fact that diabetes can lead to heart disease. And I don't know that that's true, but I do not know that that's not. And my story sort of uh, leads, leads in that direction. So take care of yourselves. And uh, sorry, this is probably a long video. But y'all, hope y'all are having a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed your Cinco de Mayo yesterday. And thank you for watching my videos. And remember to shoot straight on the range and in life. Thanks.